if you had one do over, what would it be? It would probably be my baseball academy. A baseball academy that failed after a year and a half. MVP baseball, softball academy in Raleigh. That, that was my baby before I had babies. And, and what I would do differently is just, you learn. It's like riding a bike. You skin right. your knees. And if I had a chance to do it again, I would hone in on the numbers that matter. Not stolen bases, batting averages, RBIs and home runs. Those are all great for our students. But as a business owner, you've got to understand your income statement, balance sheet and statement of cash flows. For my partner and I in business, that was like French. No Welcome to A State of Readiness, a podcast set as a fireside chat with business leaders to discuss what it takes for a company to be in a state of readiness and become a higher performance organization with your host, Joseph Paris. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of State of Readiness a podcast set as a fireside chat between me, your host, Joseph Paris, and a select industry leader. Today, that industry leader is Larry Long Jr. Larry is the founder and CEO of LLJR Enterprises, a firm that delivers sales motivation, inspiration, training, and coaching. His areas of expertise include sales training, team development, leadership, and motivation within organizations of all stages, from startup to publicly traded. In addition, his book, Jolt, was released on May 19th of 2022 and is available on Amazon, and he is the host of the Midweek Midday Motivational Minute, a podcast on his YouTube channel. Larry is an experienced sales leader with a demonstrated history of success in software as a service sales, where he brings a unique perspective to the table and understands many of the challenges faced by sales professionals today. As a former college athlete at the University of Maryland, where he played baseball, Larry is extremely passionate about coaching and helping professionals take their game to the next level. Welcome, Larry. Great to have you on my podcast. How are you doing today? What's going on, Joseph? Happy to be here. I, I can't hold on. Can, can you hear me? Is this thing on? I, <laughs> I got to make sure that everyone can hear me. I appreciate Maybe. you uh, allowing me to come on as a guest. Yeah, my, my, it's been, it'll be my pleasure. And it is my pleasure. Uh, maybe you got to open up the window there and shout a little bit louder, but uh, yeah. Um, you know, you and I met, you know, several months ago, uh, you know, as, as people do on LinkedIn and um, you know, for whatever reason, we decided to schedule an introductory call and, and we had not known each other before this connection on LinkedIn, but I got to tell you, I was really, I really enjoyed our conversation. You had so much boundless energy and enthusiasm and optimism that, you know, when I got off the phone, I was like refreshed. I felt like, wow, man, that was a really, really good use of time. Um, I enjoyed it a great deal. And then, of course, we've had some conversations since and uh, in correspondence, uh, messages and what have you. And, and every time, I don't know what it is with you, but, you know, every time, your enthusiasm and your, you know, uh, up, your being up, uh, just, you know, is contagious. And so, uh, you know, thanks for taking the time and, and being on my podcast today. Oh, thank you. And I appreciate it. And the feeling is mutual. I still remember that first conversation uh, and you sharing your background uh, and what you're working on now. Uh, my, my honor, my privilege, and my pleasure to be here with you today. Oh, that's super. So, so how did you, uh, how did you get to be Larry? Oh, What's goodness. Your journey like, man? <laughs> I've yeah. always been like this, <laughs> but, but uh, just my, my journey in a nutshell, moved around a lot as a child, lived in six different uh, states and cities and uh, got to see my parents serve. My, my father and my mother worked for uh, Department of Veterans Affairs, serving mm -hmm. our veterans and just uh, service, service, service with a smile. And my father, his background, woo, grew up in Baltimore City, only one from his family to graduate high school. So he really shared the importance of education, the importance of giving to others, the importance of attitude, uh, gratitude, you name it. So I've just, I've, I've been really fortunate along this journey. There's been ups, there's been downs. And now I'm in a position where I get to share with others, hey, here goes some things that I've learned. I, I don't know if you can see the gray, but I've had some learnings as, as I'm living, but really loving it all, even the low points. I wouldn't say loving the low points, but learning from the low points, which that's the name of the game. 
Well, you know, the low points, you know, uh, also define us. I mean, you know, how do you know if you're up, if you're never down? That's right. Or, you know, right. so, uh, so I think that, you know, I think people grow through, through their, their adversity um, and they become better people. Certainly they should become more empathetic people. Okay. Because, you know, other people have, have now been there, you know what I mean? And, uh, and, uh, you know, and we can connect with that. We can resonate with that. So, um, you know, you, you love you're an athlete right i mean yeah. you know, tell tell us about that man i've been playing sports my whole life uh baseball i've been i was so fortunate to play baseball at university of maryland go terps they had a great run this year in the super regional hosting it my former teammate matt swope uh is an assistant coach but yeah baseball basketball i grew up at the track even though my dad never pushed track on me my dad was a long jumper and triple jumper uh, shorty long, five foot eight, uh, jumping far, scholarship at Maryland. But sports, I've loved it. I mean, especially team sports, because you learn mm. so much. You learn so many life lessons. And I opened up an indoor baseball and softball academy to teach youngsters, hey, in, in, in baseball, you're going to learn about setting goals. You're going to learn about overcoming obstacles because you're going to strike out. And in baseball, <laughs> if you're a 70% failure, meaning you strike out seven out of 10 times, you're going to the Hall of Fame. There's not too many places where you're getting a pat on the back as a 30% success, but you're a 300 hitter. Uh, teamwork, it really makes the dream work. There's just so many lessons that you can learn in baseball and softball in team sports. It's been integral to my upbringing. It's been integral to me being where I'm at now, uh, I don't know if Allen Iverson listens, but practice. We're talking about practice, Allen, not the game. <laughs> in, in, in baseball and sports and in life, if you don't practice your craft, you can't expect to have success. You're just out there kind of gambling, kind of hoping mm -hmm. and wishing and praying that you have success. Well, I like to practice to give myself the best opportunity. So sports, it, it has been and it still continues to be. Uh, a, a huge part of who I am and I don't know if you knew this you you probably didn't see this in the archives but Tiger Woods is my cousin I was at the Masters for uh, nine okay. days yeah I'm Tiger's long lost cousin <laughs> they call me Larry hit it in the woods but I'm both <laughs> That's a bad <laughs> joke, but I love the golf, which just teaches you so much about the mental toughness and the mental focus and the expectation setting, as well as practice. So sports, ooh, I could talk all day. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting about uh, it's interesting about golf versus um, a team sport. Um, you know, in golf, you can never ever beat the other uh, player. You can only play better than them. You know what I mean? You, you can't influence their game except psychologically. Uh, and I find that a, a, a fascinating aspect uh, of golf. And that, uh, and it's, uh, it seems so, um, uh, I don't know, just uh, um, serene. You know what I mean? It's like out there in the course and, uh, uh, you know, you don't have the din of the crowd, unless of course you're Tiger Woods and you get the din of the crowd, right? But, you know, you know, for people like me, I get my money's worth on the golf course. You know, I, I, I refer to my uh, golf clubs as a uh, weapons of grass reduction. And, um, you know, so, so yeah, but, but, um, you know, with all of your involvement in sports, okay. And, uh, your appreciation and, and love of teamwork, uh, uh, I'm sure that, uh, you know, and we'll talk about teamwork and business in a moment, but I, you know, I, what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about some of your mentors along the way, because you could not have, you know, gained all this wisdom and all these insights uh, by yourself without having some really, really great uh, mentors and coaches along the way. So, you know, why don't you share with us, if you feel like, uh, you know, a couple of those people that most influenced you. Yeah, number one and number two, my, my mother and my father, just seeing their example day in and day out and learning from them, both through what they said, but more importantly, through what they did and how they did it uh, has had such a huge, huge impact. I moved around a lot as a youngster. And that's tough. As a young kid, you have friends and then you got to move. And my mom, she would sing, make new friends, but keep the old. One is silver while the other is gold. That was my theme song. Yeah. But uh, I can tell you that my self-confidence, it took a hit. 
And uh, every night we'd say our prayers and my mom would make me stay in the middle of the room and say out loud 10 times, I am somebody. And uh, when you do that 365 days, 365 nights, I'm not a math major. That's a lot of I am somebody. <laughs> you start to believe in yourself like I am somebody. So my mom and my dad, my, my baseball coaches, I'll never forget Larry Thompson, LT and coach Paul Donovan just spending so much time practicing at the craft and working at getting better. I owe so much to them, not just on the baseball and softball diamond, but really in life. And then as I've gone into business, I've had some mentors, some mini mentors that have really, they, they've cared for me. They've looked out for me. They've guided me kind of like a Sherpa. Uh, Corey Richardson, right. who was one of my teammates in the summer of 1999 playing wood bat uh, summer baseball. Uh, Mark Winchester, who I wrote a chapter in a book about Mark, and that chapter was called The Little Things Are Really the Big Things. I wanted to say the little things are really the big things, but since it wasn't my book, they didn't allow that. They said, <laughs> go write your own book if that's how you want to talk. I said, okay, I will. But uh, Mark Winchester really demonstrated that it's your actions. And sometimes it's the little things that go so far. I'll give you an example. Um, we went to Great Wolf Lodge. It's a water park for kids. Actually, the adults have more fun, but he called ahead and uh, sent a hundred dollar gift card. So my family, we check in and the front desk says, Mr. Mark Winchester left you a hundred dollar gift card. I'm like, wow. And it was, the money was all awesome, but it was the thought and yeah, he's yeah. thinking about my family that just went so far. When my father passed away, Mark took a day trip from North Carolina to Maryland to be there at the wake. He didn't tell me he was coming. He was just there. That's something I'll never forget and just shows how much he cares. It just, it, mm. it, it, it's, uh, it's one of those things where a lot of people talk, but it's your actions speak so loud. I can't hear what you're saying. And he just demonstrated that. And I've been fortunate to surround myself with so many great mentors, many mentors, examples of folks who just do it the right way. That's awesome. That's awesome. And, you know, how, how did you make the transition to business, you know, from Ooh. sports to, you know, doing your own thing now? Yeah, there, there's so many parallels. So many parallels, time management, prioritization, yeah. hard work, just good old hard work. And there, there's something to be said that when you work hard, it shows like there's no there's no mystery like success leaves clues. Your your most successful and excellent people, they work hard and it's not what they do when you're watching. It's what are they doing when no one's watching? That's really been the big differentiator. So sports, I learned so much. I used to have a solo hitter. Uh, it's pretty much a, a ball on a, on a rope that goes into a net. And my parents said, you want to play varsity as a freshman, you got to get the reps in. So I would come home, uh, 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 do my homework, practice my clarinet. 30 minutes. I used to play the clarinet squeaking away. <laughs> and then I would take a hundred swings off of my solo hitter. And it was really it was a hundred quality swings in, in increments of 10. How many hard line drives can I hit in increments of 10? And it was just that, that, that hard work day in and day out that translated from the baseball field to the boardroom uh, in, in the professional setting, very similar. How often do you practice? How often are you intentional? How often are you dreaming of setting goals and a vision? And then what are you committed to? Because uh, when I had my baseball academy, a lot of kids said, Coach Larry, I want to play varsity as a freshman. And my response is, no, you don't. You say you do, but when was the last time you hit off your tee? You come in and you take lessons with me, but when do you work on your game? So don't, let's keep it real. Let's call a spade a spade. You don't really want to play varsity as a freshman. You're saying it because it sounds good. If you really wanted it, I think the great Les Brown says it, how, how hungry are you? Are you right. really hungry? Do you have that burning desire to make it happen? Or are you like the majority of people? You want to talk a good game, but when push comes to shove, you don't show up. So that's been, that, for me, that's been the biggest difference. I'm five foot nine. I'm a little dude when it comes to baseball, but I can tell you there, there's not many people that are going to outwork me. There's not too many people that are going to outthink me uh, on that baseball diamond. So, 
you know, when, when you think about um, <clears throat> the, the people that you're mentoring now and you're coaching now, what are some of the lessons that you, you uh, share with them? Oh, number one, you got to believe in yourself right here, right here in your heart, right here in your mind. And the words that you say are so important. Chapter number yes. one in my book, what story are you telling yourself and believing? And I'm glad we're talking. I had a coaching client earlier today. He's in London, England. A lot of what we're doing is mindset, perspective. What questions is he asking of himself? Is he asking of his organization? And then what's his vision? I think they call it smart goals. And I'm going to give you a hot take. I think smart goals are dumb. I don't, I don't like smart goals. I like, I like the S specific check. I like the M measurable check. I like the T time bound check attainable and realistic survey says, I'm not (laughs) trying to set goals that are attainable or realistic. I'm trying to shoot for the moon. And if I miss, I'm going to be amongst the stars because what I found Joseph is that a lot of times we hold ourselves back. We, we set our expectations here when our potential is here. So we're missing out on and we're fooling ourselves because we write a fake narrative. And I've been guilty, guilty as charged. I'm not good enough at writing to write my own book. I, my, my English teachers would laugh at me. There's no way Larry Long Jr. is writing a book. Well, I think in the words of Kevin Garnett when the Boston Celtics won the championship, anything is possible. And what I found is that the human spirit, if you can dream it, you can really achieve it. I think that was Walt Disney. You know, if you can dream it, you can do it. I think that was the the quote, but, but, you know, um, you're right about, um, uh, you know, setting goals, you know, for me, I don't know what I can't do until I can't do it, right? Until I dis- discover it, you know? Like, you know, we talked about golf. There's a reason I won't be on the PGA Tour because, like, you know, I suck. Um, and, and no amount of work is going to fix that, you know? Um, uh, but, uh, you know, these uh, these goals that we have, I think sometimes it's good to set specific tangible goals only as waypoints you know, if you think about sailing, way, waypoints on your journey to the next and to the next and to the next, you know, a way of measuring your progress, if you will. That's right. I love. But if you think I of that it. goal as being your destination and that's it, I mean, you know, you're, you're an athlete. You know, how many athletes do you know peaked in high school? You know what I mean? And they go to the you know 20 year reunion and, you know, their best years were when they're 18. You know, and that's a pretty sad, you know, state of affairs. So, you know, it, it, it's enough to, to get to that, you know, rock stardom in high school, but then you have to think about the next and the next and the next. So true. In the words of Willie Jolly, who's one of my, uh, one, one of my speaker colleagues, the best is yet to come. And sometimes folks lose that vision. They lose that belief. And that, that's why I wrote my book. I'm, I'm trying to get people unstuck I'm trying to get them back on track to number one, believing in, but also stepping into their greatness. We, Joseph, we all have greatness inside of us. We all have greatness. Sometimes we lose that that vision. We lose that belief that we can be great. And and when you don't believe it, it's tough to do it. It's tough to achieve it. So I'm, I'm here to get people zapped into intentionality so they can rediscover, believe in, and step into their inner greatness. I'm, I'm trying to keep my droplets to myself because I know the time, six feet apart, but I'm trying to spread this positivity and this belief of, of stepping into our inner greatness. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, let's talk about your book. Uh, and, and thank you. I, I just received this uh, just a couple of days ago, but so thank you on that. Um, but, uh, and I have uh, plans to read it on my flight to, to Florida coming up. But let's, let's first off talk about uh, the title, Jolt, okay? Uh, there's got to be some hidden meaning there, or maybe not so hidden. Uh, how did you come up with that title? Yeah, well, Joseph, you mentioned it before. Uh, I'm the CEO of LLJR Enterprises, and CEO is not your traditional CEO. 
I'm the chief energy officer. So Joe, that just goes with it that we're going to bring some energy and we're going to make sure that we get people zapped. I've never been struck by lightning, but I can only imagine when you get hit with lightning, it's going to give you a, woo, it's going to give you a wake up call. That's what my book is really geared towards. It's, it's geared towards, hey, let's get you out of the rut. Let's get you out of that that, that, that uh, complacency of just going with the flow. No, there's a saying, if it ain't broke, most people say, don't fix it. I say, if it ain't broke, let's break it. Let's <laughs> shake it. Let's flip it upside down. Let's bring some energy so that we can figure out what's next. We can figure out what else. You might be good. That's not good enough. Let's be great. You might be great. Let's be wonderful. You might be wonderful. Let's be excellent. Let's continue to strive to be the best because we don't know what our maximum is until we try to get to our max. And I don't think we can ever max out. I don't think we can ever max out. I think that uh, I'm not a Greek, uh, I'm not a Latin scholar, but I think they call it carpe diem, seize yeah. the day. And I met a gentleman who had that tattooed on his forearm. He had carpe noctum, seize the night. I think <laughs> if we seize the day and the night, we can do things that we never would have imagined, which is my book. And my book came about I, towards the beginning of the pandemic. I started a video series. And I got to say thank you to one of my mentors, Morgan Ingram. He said, Larry, I see you writing short form content on LinkedIn. You got to get on video. I said, nah, dude, I got the face for radio. I'm scared. Everyone's going to laugh at me. He said, dude, everyone's already laughing at you, but you got to get on video. He said, I'm going to tell you what my mentor told me. If you don't do it, you're being selfish. It's not about you. If you can impact one person's life for the positive, it's well worth it. And when he told that to me on a Friday, I said, no one's going to call me selfish and get away with it. I got the pink bat over here. <laughs> that Wednesday, I went out on my back porch and started my, at the time I called it the midday midweek. Now it's called the midweek midday motivational minute. This Wednesday is going to be episode number 112, 112. Wow, out of the last 113 weeks. Every Wednesday at 12 noon Eastern time, I prepare uh, and share a word of encouragement, a word of motivation, hopefully a word of transformation. That's where my book, it came from my seven, seven most meaningful topics uh, from my midweek, midday motivational minute. So how long did it take you to write your book? You said you started Ooh. it at the uh, beginning of the pandemic or? I, I started my book in January of 2021. And okay. uh, it, it dropped on May the 19th. It was about uh, it was about a year and three months working with my team. I, I had a, a book consultant. I had a self-publishing consultant, had a few editors, a graphic designer. And I had so much support because I'll be honest with you, Joseph. There were times where I was ready to tap out and give up. I, I said, this is this isn't fun. This is tough. <laughs> and when the going gets tough, I think they say the tough get going. Woo, but my team really rallied. And Hercules, Hercules, they came through and said, Larry, let's take it back to the core. Why are you writing this book? And my whole purpose of writing the book was to impact one person's life for the positive. Another kind of byproduct as an African-American male, I want to serve as an example. It, it's tough to be what you can't see. And for me to be able to see my father, that gave me the confidence that I can be anything, no matter what's going on, I can be anything if I put my mind to it. I want to pass that baton literally and figuratively to the next little Larry Long Jr. that's out there wondering, can I be an astronaut? Can I be a lawyer? Can I be a CEO and own my own business? I'm trying to demonstrate that you can be Whatever it is you want to be, you got to surround yourself with the right team. You got to have that belief inside of you. And most importantly, you've got to work. One of my chapters is called Back to Basics. The basics is please, thank you, and hard work. You got to put in that work. You got to shoot. You got to do the digging. <laughs> put a little bit of elbow grease. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I, I got to congratulate you on finishing your book. I, I wrote uh, my book. It was published in 2017. Um, it was a long, arduous journey. I mean, I had some great uh, uh, support. I had, uh, you know, Carrie Vixen Lawrence uh, was my was my Sherpa. And you know, my, uh, you know, she knew how to kick my ass when 
when I was uh, <laughs> uh, down, you know what I mean? And I, I actually had to put the project aside for uh, almost a half a year because it got to the point where it was just words on a page. You know what I mean? Like I just couldn't, I couldn't see it anymore. And uh, uh, so, you know, I, I, I knew I wasn't abandoning the project, even though some people thought I was, but I did have to set it aside because I just, I mean, I was just, uh, I was stuck in neutral. Um, but obviously it's, it was on the shelf. So it was quite successful and, and happy for it, but c congratulations to you, man. I, I know a lot of people talk about it. A lot of people talk about write, uh, writing a book. There's so few that do it. So, um, and, and now I appreciate, you know, it was funny because before I published the book, people would send me, you know, signed copies of their book. All right. And, and I appreciate it. And I read them all and everything else, but I had a whole different appreciation. Once I published mine, it was like, Holy Jesus, this was like, you know, they, they had to rip their guts out in order to get this thing onto the shelf. And uh, so, yeah, congratulations on that. And I'm so, I'm so blessed. My, I have a 12 year old son, an eight year old daughter. We're now brainstorming on a children's book project with them involved, which is just, I, I never would have imagined. Who would have thunk it? And as an author, I don't even know if I can talk like that, but who would have thunk it? Larry Long with his kids writing a children's book. Come on, Cletus. So <laughs> it's amazing, absolutely amazing. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, um, you used some colloquialisms there, you know what I mean? I think and I believe that, um, you know, speaking in your true voice is the best way of connecting with people, uh, whether it's written or verbal. Um, you know, I have some idioms uh, that I use regularly um, and I wouldn't be me without them. And people know that. And so uh, it's hard for me to get a ghostwriter. I'm sure it's hard for you to get a ghostwriter too, because it's not your genuine voice then when it's written. Yeah. Well, I was so fortunate because I worked with Michelle Hill. Hey, Michelle, who was my book consultant, ghostwriter. She helped me through the, uh, the writing, the developing process and really capturing my voice. And that's what I'm most proud of is that, uh, like I said, the book that I, co that I co-authored uh, the little things are the big fangs. They wouldn't allow that. My book, we talk about fangs <laughs> <laughs> because that's how I talk. And yeah. I'm now uh, working, I'm working with a uh, audio book consultant and I'm about to get in the studio to record my own audio book, which is really going to allow the words to jump off. And it's, it's crazy to even say this, but thinking about a streaming series, video series of the book, make the book come to life even more. So it's, uh, it's just exciting. It's exciting to learn, to impact others for the positive and to show that anything, and I mean anything, is possible. Well, I've been following your uh, LinkedIn posts and you've been, you know, you've been on the speaking circuit here uh, pretty uh pretty seriously the last, uh, well, since your book came out. Um, I don't even know how many universities and other uh, engagements that you've uh, you've shared on LinkedIn, but it looks like, well, I'll tell you what, you're surrounded, first off, I noticed that you're surrounded by people smiling, yeah. okay? Yeah. I mean, everybody in the audience, I mean, you know, you're really resonating with people, it, just like our first conversation, you know, I was like, you know, energized uh, afterwards. But, you know, it's obviously that you're, you know, a, a positive and indelible influence on the people that you touch. And, I, you know, kudos to that, because I think that you're, you're really a, a special individual. I mean, uh, you know, like I said, uh, but I see that in the audience. So um, the people that are around you are, are joyous for having experienced uh, you. Um, but we were talking about some young people a little bit ago, um, you know, do you, you know, and you're talking about hard work, all right? And do you think that the, you know, the the young, I don't want to say the younger generation, because it sounds like my father, right? But, um, you know, do you think that there's a lot, this millennial and Gen Z, where they don't want to work? Um, or what's your take on that? Yeah, I, I would not classify them as not wanting to work. I would say, and, and each individual is an individual, but I would say that folks are now aware of different routes, different ways to go about uh, life and different priorities. Uh, whereas before folks might've prioritized work over everything, 
Now folks are saying, you know what? I'm going to prioritize experiences and travel and learning the things that I want to learn over the traditional work model. I've met some folks of all ages. I was just at University of Kentucky two weekends ago with a group of student leaders, uh, ODK, Omicron Delta Kappa. The most, some of the most impressive, just amazing young superstars. I can tell you our future is bright. And there's always going to be tough times there with turbulence and chaos. I don't know much, but that's a constant. There's always going to be turbulence and chaos going on. But I can tell you our future is bright because these bright young minds are thinking differently. They're, 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 not, they're not following along the same path. So I, I'm, I'm encouraged. I'm inspired by them. And I try my best to share that encouragement and that inspiration with others because although we want to keep our droplets to ourselves, we need to continue to spread positivity spread the smile smile smiles are contagious and try it you, you look in the mirror and smile i guarantee you that person's gonna smile back it works <laughs> in groups of people too when you mm -hmm. smile everyone smiles and feeling good and i don't i don't think that you have to have your game face on just to be serious. Like you go to some offices and everyone, I'm like, why so serious? Like you only live once. Why not have fun? You can take care of business and be serious about your business with a smile on your face. No one said you can't smile, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I am. When, when I think about the, the younger generation, it's bright. It is bright. And it's different, which I love. I love that they're shaking it up and they're saying, hey, we can have both. We, we can have the work and we can have the play. And maybe we have more play than work. Whatever makes you happy, go for it. Go for it. So, so just to, you know, getting towards the end here, a couple of uh, wrap up questions, if you will. Yeah. Um, one's going to be a little bit serious. If if you, well, I guess they're all serious, right? But in their own right. Um, but if you had one do-over, what would it be? Oh, we, uh, one do-over. It would probably be my baseball academy. My baseball academy that failed after a year and a half. MVP baseball, softball academy in Raleigh. That, that was my baby before I had babies. And, and what I would do differently is just, you learn. It's like riding a bike. You skin right. your knees. And if I had a chance to do it again, I would hone in on the numbers that matter not stolen bases batting averages rbis and home runs those are all great for our students but as a business owner you've got to understand your income statement balance sheet and statement of cash flows for my partner and i in business that was like french no parlez-vous francais we <laughs> we'd sit there with our accountant eyes glazed over we would take all the papers he would give us and just throw them into the into the little file cabinet, never to be seen again. And there's no mystery. That's how we ran out of cash. We didn't understand the importance of cash flow. If you've got more money going out the back door than you have coming in the front door, ooh, you're going to run out of cash, Larry. And the bank of Mama and Papa Long, they said, hey, you're not a big bank. You're not too big to fail. We love you so much. We're going to let you wrap that thing up. So that would be my biggest do over being able to serve the community and youngsters through the game of baseball and softball, showing them life skills. When I do it again, I'm going to make sure that I know the numbers that count. Yeah. So, I mean, <clears throat> that's a tough lesson to learn, isn't it? You know, um, tough and expensive, <laughs> you know, but this is, you know, as a bit of an aside uh, in Europe, if your business fails, you might not ever, first off, it'll, it might take seven years for you to run through the bankruptcy courts. Wow. Okay. You might not, you might be prohibited from ever running a business again. Wow. And that's no, that's no lie. It's very, very harsh if you fail in business and in the United States, and this is one of the, the great things about this country, I believe, if you fail, you're not ostracized. You know what I mean? You, you, you. I will guarantee you, even though that's a that's a do-over, that is a life lesson that they couldn't teach you at university. 
HK, HKU, Hard Knocks University. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I, I absolutely, get to come back, come back to bat again, and uh, I'm going to learn that lesson from the strikeout in order to hit a home run. <laughs> Ab- absolutely, absolutely. So what would be, uh, as a wrap-up question here, what would be one golden piece of advice that you would give to anybody in the audience? That golden nugget, piece nugget of, of golden wisdom. piece of advice. Audit who you spend your time with. Audit what you have coming in. If you're surrounding yourself with negative Nancys, negative Nellies, even negative Ned, and I apologize if anyone listening's name is Nancy, Ned, or Nelly, but uh, if you're surrounding yourself with those folks, guess what? You're going to be negative. So really audit and, and, and be mindful around who you spend time with. Those folks that always have problems and, oh, this is the worst. No, you got to shed them. And sometimes those are family members and friends. You got to cut it. It's that important. Also, what are you consuming? Not food, because I'd be a fried chicken. I I don't know if you know about Bojangles, chicken and biscuits, but it's bow time. (laughs) But what are you consuming? Books, audio books, podcasts, Uh, What are you watching on TV? If you have doom and gloom coming in, you are what you eat. You're going to have doom and gloom coming out. So you talked about the folks I surround myself with are smiling. That's because they're naturally smilers. And I surround myself with people, not necessarily that are exactly like me, but I really try to shed those energy vampires. I try to shed those negative where it's like, no, that's, that's a wrong story. That's fake news. I can't be around that because you're going you're gonna to bring me down and then I'm going to bring everyone else down. So just being intentional. I encourage folks, be aware of your environment, your surrounding and be intentional. That's great. That's great stuff. Highly recommend you grab this book, Jolt. Uh, Larry, thanks for joining me today. I really, really appreciate it. I appreciate your energy. I hope uh, we meet face to face someday. That'd be a special moment. We will certainly make it happen. Thank you for hosting me. State of readiness. We're going to stay ready. Thank you, Joseph. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Larry. Thank you for listening to State of Readiness. You can discover more episodes and learn about the book written by Joseph Paris of the same title at www.state-of-readiness.com You can learn more about Joseph Paris at www.josephparis.me card